Rabbi Menes Friedman, hello, thank God it's Tuesday. Um, thank you so, so much for um, allocating this hour to us. And I just told our um, listeners that I had the privilege and the pleasure of spending um, last weekend at Base Hana Retreat in Lake George. I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful retreat. It's a beautiful place. But the beauty was not in the place. It was, um, it was in spirit. It was an amazingly beautiful spiritual experience. And I just thought that usually you need 10 men <laughs> for godliness to be present. But um, I've been in a company of 10 men, you know, on the, on the side. <laughs> and I not even closely experienced the godliness, the spiritual high that I have experienced being among women. And not all of these women were um, observant, you know, let's say close. I don't want to, I don't want to say anything. Different level of observancy, different level of spirituality. But this togetherness, this unity, I mean, realistically, this is the second year I have gone and I have never, ever felt anywhere the way I feel in the presence of these Jewish women that come from all over the world, all over. We had people from um, France. We had people from, I believe, Ecuador and uh, California. I mean, all over America. Not a tremendous amount of women. What was it about f between 50 and 70 women? I did not count, but it, that's what it felt like. But it's just, it's just, it's, it's magic. You feel so much less physical and so much more spiritual. And it's, and, and, and it's, and it's just, it's spirituality on high. So this is why, why I would like to speak to you about this uh, organization. It's, it's, it's an organization that you have formed many, many years ago. And I would like to first know how it was formed, how long ago it was formed, what its mission is, what its programs are. I mean, we'll take it step by step. I just want to give a little bit heads up to our listeners what to expect. And, and what is going on? What is going on with spirituality in this organization? How come it's uh, sp spirituality on high like nowhere else? What is happening? What What's causing it? And yes, no drugs. <laughs> no drugs present. Just very healthy atmosphere. Um, a lot of um, a lot of good food and a lot of good people. <laughs> Good food. Oh, yeah. Good uh, food was excellent. Very healthy. This is really love that aspect as well. It's always, you know, it's, it's some it's not the most important part, but it's certainly a very, very nice enhancement. Yeah, there were no drugs <laughs> and there was no religiosity. Yeah. That's that's an important part of it. So actually, if you want a little bit of the history, it started about 51 years ago <coughs> Excuse me, in Minnesota at the Chabad Center there. 1971, we purchased a new building for the Chabad House. And it was an old monastery. So it was, it was large, had many bedrooms, and it was empty for the summer because everybody's out of town. So we're thinking, what can we do during the summer to use this building? And almost, almost half-heartedly or jokingly, <clears throat> we thought, you know, there's no place for women to go to something like a yeshiva women who want to learn, who have not learned, who don't know anything, Hebrew, nothing. There was not a single place for them to go. So we thought, you know, building's empty, bedrooms are available, let's invite college students to come and uh, study a little bit. And, and, and we meant a little bit. 
After all, it's their vacation time. So we thought, you know, if they would come, we would put them up, we would feed them. They'll do a little sightseeing, and they'll do a little shopping, and sleep late. I mean, after all, it's vacation. And then sometime in the afternoon, maybe we'll have a class, maybe in the evening when they come back from shopping. This is 1971. Eighteen women showed up. Most of them were the radical students of the 60s who had tried to change the campuses to uh, protest the war in Vietnam. These, these were the tough, brave, ambitious women who belonged to the SDS, Socialist Democratic Society or something, I don't know what it was called. <laughs> they were radicals. They were radicals. And they were disappointed because the, re the revolution never happened. The war didn't stop and, and the campuses didn't change. But we had sent out a little flyer to six campuses and 18 women show up because the flyer said, come discover the purpose of life. They came in angry, angry. <laughs> you know the purpose of life? <laughs> Whoa, calm down. <laughs> <clears throat> so when we told them that the plan is that they'll do a little sightseeing, a little shopping, a little sleeping late, oh no, not these women. <laughs> They had way too much energy and way too much idealism, and the class. And it ended up that I had to be the teacher, which was not part of the plan. But you know, they want they wanted to know, they wanted to learn. You know, you invited us. Now you better teach us. They weren't concerned with the food. They weren't concerned with the with the uh, arrangements. I was sleeping in there in their sleeping bags and in their, without exaggeration, classes started nine o'clock in the morning and ended eight o'clock in the morning. They didn't need to eat, they didn't need to sleep, they were on fire. So we studied and debated and discussed and learned throughout the day. What did you teach them? Oh, so what do you teach somebody who can't read Hebrew? <clears throat> Obviously, we're not going to go through a, a thorough educational process here. Right? So you got to go with uh, the basics. We started with Tanya. I <laughs> That's <read> the basics. <laughs> I read the Hebrew and translated and discussed it was unbelievable. Every class was, wow, life-changing. Wow, I never knew that. Wow, that made... Basically, what they wanted to know is, we tried to fix society. We tried to make life better, or people better. It didn't work. What do, what do you think you have that can make life better and make people better and and they found it. Tanya was so relevant to them, made so much sense. And it looked like a plan how to make the world better. So they taught me all about politics, <laughs> about the um, industrial, uh, military industrial. <laughs> Whatever. Complex. <laughs> Complex. Yeah. And the corruption and the problems and that, you know, really. Like, and I it thought... It wasn't 2023, it was uh, 1971? Yeah. Oh, so we've been going through this for a while now. <laughs> so I thought, okay, now I know what's going on on campuses. <laughs> this was three months of the summer. It was so good that we decided to do it again the next summer. 
And I was ready because I knew all about them. The military industrial complex corruption problems. <laughs> One year later, 1972, nobody was interested in politics. Nothing. You couldn't even start a conversation about it. All they were interested in was Buddhism, Eastern religion, meditation. Same Everybody, women or different women? Different women. Mm. Uh, everybody had a guru. Everybody had a, a, a master. and a, They were all into cults. That, that, was, that was the only thing they were interested in. So, uh, you know, for three months, I found out all there is to know about Buddhism and Hinduism and <laughs> so it was so good 42 women showed up and the results were so good we thought you know maybe we should make a winter session also because there's a break in January or at the end of December there's a break from college people can come for a week so we offered a week 102 women show up in Minnesota in January. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Friedman, uh, just wanted to know, the 42 women who were into Buddhism and Hinduism, what happened to them after the three-month session with you? So about 70% of them went to Crown Heights. <laughs> They didn't have anything for them over there. Some of them sat in on the uh, on the classes of uh, nine-year-old girls in Beis Rivka. They were desperate to learn, to practice, to live the life, and they became part of the community. Eventually, they started a school for them and a dormitory and so on. But for the first couple of years, so this was in January, after the summer of 72, this is January 73, only a few months later, nobody was interested in Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> it was over, it was finished for the Jewish kids. All they were interested in is macrobiotic foods and seaweed and carrot juice. <laughs> We had five kitchens, five different styles of cooking, because this one ate the, everybody had their own. And they were feeding me carrot juice. You know what happens when you drink carrot juice? You turn orange. <laughs> Your palms. Your palms turn orange. Not from handling the carrots. <laughs> Internally, that, uh. <laughs> so that was a whole new experience. Every year, it's a different world. What they were interested in a few months ago, gone, over, done with, nobody cares. The only subject that remained consistent was family. If uh, the class was getting a little boring or a little, you know, people were starting to yawn, All I had to do was say, you know, most women turn out to be like their mothers. That was always dynamite. Whoa, did that get a reaction? <laughs> Because family, marriage, divorce, always, always intense interest. That's been forever. So, m what I learned most about life in these United States is about relationships, the dating habits, the dating style, li lifestyle, marriage, divorce, in-laws, cheating, always, always a big topic, and still is. 
could be that today it's the only topic that it really means anything to anybody. Because everything else is disappointing. So that's how it all started. It was unique because it wasn't about becoming religious. And it wasn't about becoming a Hebrew scholar. I mean, they were only there for a month, most of them. So what can you learn in a month? Even less. Actually, some women came for a weekend. What could you learn? Basics. What is a Jew? What is the Torah? Who is God? That's about all you can do in a week or even in a month. So we didn't try to teach Hebrew. We didn't try to make them for the religious because it's too quick, too fast, too. It was like, look, I'm going to tell you what the reality is and then you're going to leave and you're going to have to handle it. It was very, very effective. What was beautiful about it was that we had no age limits. Word got out that there's good learning for women. Women who were not in college started coming. Grandmothers started showing up. And not just from the Midwest, because we sent the flyers to six colleges in the Midwest. All of a sudden, people were coming from California. People were coming from Russia, from Israel. So the, we were in St. Paul, Minnesota. Can you imagine somebody coming from Yerushalayim <laughs> to St. Paul, Minnesota to learn Judaism? Amazing. But that was happening. So having, we had one year, we had a 14-year-old from England, very smart girl, sitting next to a grandmother from Morocco. It was, it was so strange because she was 14, the girl, going on 15. This grandmother from Morocco got married at 15. <laughs> the difference between them and their mentality and their culture and their, and they're sitting in the same class, listening and hearing the same lecture, the same subject, and both were benefiting. This is, Tony, that is amazing. Rabbi Friedman, that is actually my question. I mean, this time around, too, the, we had younger and older and everywhere in the middle women, and it age was not a factor whatsoever. Everybody was very interested in being together, learning together, um, growing together. But this aspect of spirituality on high how do you explain that? How do you explain that? Because realistically, it's 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 just it it feels like it truly is an out of body, slightly out of body experience. It seems like the physicality stops to matter, and it becomes such a unity of spirit. I I'm a little bit worried to sound insane right now, <laughs> you know. Uh, and Go ahead, but, take a chance. Yeah, I am. I'm actually taking a chance because this is the second time I felt it. I felt like out of body experience. That's the best that I can do. Can explain it without drugs, without alcohol, <laughs> without any kind of uh, special effects. Just by being there, just by being together, just by studying. What do you think causes this? And I know I'm not the one who felt this. I mean, I don't want to sound like, you know, I don't want to add more to it than what it is, because what it is, is amazing. And uh, truly something that, uh, you know, you feel so comfortable. You feel like there's no threat. You know, this is probably the only place that I felt more comfortable than anywhere else to be myself and um to learn and to interact and it, it's it, i felt very safe 
And I think every woman there feels exactly that. Not that that's what we go there for. This is just an incredible side effect. Um, can you explain why this is happening? Um, you know, and I'm sure it's been probably something that everybody has been um, saying to you all along <laughs> from the year 1971 since this uh, organization was formed and since yeah, yeah. this has been happening. We had one woman, maybe in the in the 80s, who was a, uh, a, a therapist, a psychologist, a social worker, whatever. She was there for a couple of days, and she was she was puzzled. People felt safer in the environment there at Beis Hana than they do when they come to her for counseling. Her clients don't feel as safe with her as all these people felt with each other at this at this uh, retreat. So safety, feeling safe, yeah, it's a very common reaction that people are taken by surprise. They open up, they're completely honest with each other, they say things they never told anybody else, including their therapists. So, actually, rather than describing it as an out-of-body experience, it was an experience where you actually felt in your body, and it was okay. It was an unusual in-body experience. <laughs> because the discomforts of life, the pressures, the tension, the anxiety, doesn't let you settle into your body. That's the disturbance of anxiety. When you feel really safe, you're okay with your own body. And there's peace between your body and your soul. So it could be like, oh boy, I'm feeling my soul more than ever, so this is an out-of-body experience. And on the other hand, I'm totally comfortable with my body, so it's an in-body experience. <laughs> it's the harmony between body and soul. And it comes not because of something that we're doing, but because of the things we don't do. There is no expectation, no demands, no, no agenda. Come, we'll be Jewish. We'll be Jewish. What kind of Jew? Don't care. Don't care. Come and enjoy being a Jew. How will that express itself? Who knows? Maybe you'll eat more cholent. I don't know. Doesn't matter. So there's no drugs. There's no. There's no anything. It's completely free of 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 agenda, free of expectation, free of demand. Nice to be Jewish, no? Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> that's all we're gonna say. You want to talk about Jewish history, Jewish stories, Jewish, shrine, whatever you want. Rabbi Friedman, and there's um, another thing that is an incredible side effect. Um, you know, we come in and, and we kind of judge this world a little bit like, this is my kind of thing and this is not my kind of thing. This is my kind of person. This is not my kind of person. And what has happened to me absolutely twice, okay, the, in the first retreat and the second retreat, is that the person who initially I thought was the least my kind, you know, uh, turned out to be the most. <laughs> and it was, you know, I, I, I go to Beis Hanna without expectation. Well, I'll be honest, the first time I went was with expectation uh, to have uh, be around you in the 3D uh, environment where we're not on Zoom, but where we can actually hear your lectures live. And that was the reason why I initially uh, went to um, Base Hana. But that 
that is amazing but it's not it was not the thing as i as i thought it would be uh, <laughs> friedman of course it's it, please understand that this is a, a huge honor to be in your presence always but well, it's yeah <laughs> But uh, the things that you totally uh, don't expect happen. So the person who I, I thought would be, would be least of my kind of person turned out to be the most imp impressive and amazing person that I got to know. And again, this happened two times in a row, last year and this year. And, uh, you know, the whole world is looking for love everybody wants love everybody is seeking out love and everybody goes somewhere and god is about love and uh major concerts you feel the love and everybody wants this love feeling i do not go to base hana for love but this is exactly what i get uh the feeling of love is overwhelming when you take a look at each one of these women there, after first few hours, even less than that, you it's everyone is an incredible universe, an incredible story, an incredible energy. And and you cannot help yourself but feel this love towards another person, another human being who is there. Again at the risk of sounding insane, this is what I felt and this is what absolutely every single woman there felt and we're still on chats and we're still can't get enough of each other and this keeps on going. What is this? How is this caused? Why is it so easy there and it's not so easy for us in our everyday life? Because we all want it. And it's the same, the same uh, cause, the same, when, when you're relieved of all your anxieties and should be and what, what needs to be and what, and you're just allowed to be yourself, people are very nice. <laughs> just, just relax, you know, and, and when they have nothing but Judaism in common, You make friends like, yeah, like no place else. Because you're completely honest with each other. There's no way you can impress the other women. There's no way they can impress you. Because no, no, nothing matters. And yet, you're idealistic. You're looking for something. You want to be better. You want to grow. The word safe really does describe you're safe with your body and you're safe with your soul. That doesn't happen. If you go to a spiritual retreat, you're not so safe with your body. If you go to a spa, you're not so safe with your soul. <laughs> to, be, to be completely comfortable with your body and your soul at the same time it's a little heavenly. It's so, a lot heavenly, I would say, for yeah. sure. So when people are that relaxed, only goodness comes out. Because why not? Being, being good is the right thing. Being good is what we all want. And yet, it seems so difficult to get there because of all the noise and all the distractions and all the demands and all the needs that we think we have. You come to Beis Chana and the first message is, you don't need anything. We'll provide. You don't need anything except to get comfortable and listen. All of a sudden, all those burdens fall away. No expectations. You can ask any question you want. You can offer any opinion you want. People will either agree with you or disagree with you, but they will enjoy 
your conversation because nobody's threatening nobody's out to get anybody else nobody's recruiting you to their cause not even the cause of Judaism because the fact that you're Jewish and you're there for a Jewish event can't be better the rest is commentary (laughs) Jews enjoying Jews there's nothing better there is nothing better. So the prerequisite is to be Jewish to feel this way? <laughs> that is one of the yeah prerequisites. <laughs> Rabbi Friedman, d- did you know that this is going to turn out this way? Is it something that was pre-planned? Because usually any organization has a mission statement that we want to accomplish this. This is the reason for our formation and our work um well it it's it's really consistent with the feminine psyche if it was a group of men it wouldn't be that safe because there are so many mitzvahs daily that you have to be doing well every day goes by you don't do it there's there's tension there's pressure there's expectation and as a result, there is resistance. I don't like I don't like tension. I don't like expectations. So I will not do the mitzvah, and you will not convince me. There's always something going on with men, because men are always trying to achieve something or prove something. Women don't need that. Women love what is perfect in the world. And just leave them alone to enjoy the goodness of the world, and they're they're fine. Men don't like that. What what do you mean everything's good? Then then what am I here for? You got to find something that's not good that I can fix for you. Otherwise, I feel useless. So with men, it's it's always more of an agenda, a good agenda. But the feminine psyche is. If everything is perfect, wow, that's perfect. You can actually get excited because there is nothing to fix. Men get depressed if there's nothing to fix. So it's a very feminine approach to Judaism. You are Jewish. You will always be Jewish. You're as Jewish as you can get. Relax. It's That's... The other thing is, after a few years of these sessions, we thought maybe we should become a little more formal, at least give the art, give the program a name. They had no name. So we thought we should name it Beis Hana. Hana was the name of the Rebbe's mother. And uh, we asked the Rebbe, you know, would it be respectful or disrespectful to name a program for college students after your mother, who was a very special, amazing woman? The Rebbe said yes. And it seems like anything that carried his mother's name, the Rebbe took a special interest. It became personal. Yeah, he was interested in every Chabad house because it was Chabad. But when his mother's name appeared on it, it became something else. And I think that the blessing that the Rebbe gave us on when he when he allowed us to name it after his mother created this unusual uh, atmosphere that is very much like the Rebbe. You know, when people would go for a dollar get in line on Sunday and the Rebbe would hand them a dollar to give to charity and maybe say a few words people had the same reaction in just that minute oh the Rebbe knows me the Rebbe saw me and it was safe so for 50 years that's what it's been In more recent years, like the last 20 years, we don't have all ages at the same time. 
We have college students for college students. We have teenagers for their program during the summer. We have older women when you attended. We have single mothers. So I guess this is the age of specialization. And we have to treat each segment of society differently. So that's what we're doing now. We have about 15 sessions a year. From three weeks with the teenagers to a three days for mature women. Depending on you know how much time they can take off. It's also not always in Minnesota. People are not so willing to put up with the winters and the snow and the airports being closed and delays and so we take it to different places. And so people still come, come from all over. They come from all over the world. Um, wherever you have it, people come. Rabbi Friedman, you know, when I speak to uh, people, uh, why they are always, you know, have very special relationship with you, with your Zoom uh, lectures or um, YouTube lectures. Everybody says the same thing. Everybody says, Rabbi Friedman is so easy to understand. So easy. Whatever information you give, it's easily comprehensible. And I've noticed that a base HANA teachers uh, have the same style of teaching. Um, they're very easily understood. They're very personable and um, they're definitely very caring. Um, what kind of prerequisites? Uh, how do you find teachers for base HANA? Because they're pretty amazing ladies teaching there. We've had so many different teachers. Because there are so many educated, intelligent women, and of all of them, we're down to about three that we invite consistently and almost represent Beis Hana now because of these, these qualities that you're describing. Not every educated woman, woman is, is easily understood. Not every inspired woman is inspiring so yeah we, we we went through a lot of different candidates and we're down to about three or four that are really the right tone the right message the right personality and it it creates that atmosphere who right now is uh, the person who runs base Hana who is responsible for choosing the right teachers, choosing the right programs, choosing the right places to meet and organizes everything wonderful that is happening at base Hana. That's uh, Mrs. Hindaleya Sharfstein. She started as a student in her in her college years and um, when it, when it became necessary, she took control and she in a, introduced some of the changes, like it doesn't have to be in Minnesota and it should be special for college women. They like to, they like to be among their own, although there's something very nice about having a mixed age group because that's like real life. In real life, no, not everybody is 20. <laughs> <laughs> but still, they, they like, they, they're, they're accustomed to being among their own age group, so that's what we do. Rabbi Friedman, are, sure. there, are there a lot of um, incredible stories after women have had this? Uh, I mean... I personally know a lot of women who, for whom Base Hana was a life-changing experience, who, for whom it transformed their lives, who definitely um, got a lot out of it and are so grateful to Base Hana. Are there any stories that stand out that maybe you can tell us something that really, really stands out, some sort of... Um, ins inspiration I, I mean I think every story is inspirational but maybe there's some this there's this one <laughs> that you can share with us I don't know if there is one 
you know, 50 years of watching people's lives change, it becomes like, yeah, sure. What, your life didn't change? Oh, what a failure. We must have done something really wrong. Because if you come and you hear about Torah and about your own soul and who you are, if it doesn't change your life, then, then we have failed. Then we're not saying enough. We're not doing the right thing. Something is wrong if bringing Torah into your life doesn't change your life. Something is wrong. And I don't mean change your life in terms of uh, your schedule, that you don't work on Shabbat, for example. That's not life changing. That's lifestyle changing, which is sometimes good too. But it's not as exciting as life changing. Because when the fundamentals change, it's a whole different life. It's not just different activities. So some people can become more observant, but their life doesn't change. Their schedule changes. But most people, when you hear the truth, when you get it, you're a different person. You're a different person. Your husband doesn't recognize you. That's the way it should be. So that's not the surprise. The surprise is when it doesn't happen. <laughs> Anybody walks away from Beis Khan and says, eh, that's, wow, what went wrong? Rabbi Friedman, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything you do. I mean, Beis Hana, um, your lectures your organizations and uh, it's it's just it's just amazing how you and everyone um who is involved with you are just changing the world with each word at a time each word each experience each everything it's it's just it's just incredible thank you so so much for everything you're doing thank you for the time you allocate for us a weekly it's absolutely priceless i can never thank you enough for it on behalf of our entire community our entire radio and um hopefully next uh tuesday thank god it's tuesday we'll get to speak about what's what what kind of year we should look forward to hopefully yeah we all know that we're getting so so close we all feel it we all uh already it's it's, it's very hard for anybody to see not not to see that the world is changing and it's changing more and more rapidly with every second so i so look forward to next week's conversation when we're already um so close to um a change of energy this is what's going to happen not this friday but next friday and i so look forward to talk to talking to you about it and i've been getting regards from you people you know or people your friends the most recent one was in Chabad of Bensonhurst oh. a large Russian community and they listen to you or they know you personally and that's why they came to the program that's amazing that's amazing last Saturday night wow thank you very much thank you Rabbi Friedman um, until next week be well and thank you thank you from all of us only good news only good news <laughs>